to most of us, this fire means warmth and light. But to the people of Lytton and Monte Creek and the surrounding First Nation communities, this fire means destruction and pure hell. Poof. All gone. In 2021, British Columbia has witnessed 1,600 wildfires burning nearly 8,700 square kilometers of forests. Just like that, in a blink of an eye, British Columbia was left with scarred mountain ranges, charred rolling valleys, and burnt down communities. So what was supposed to stop the rain? Instantly, our forests were reduced to a pile of kindling, going from forest greens to charcoal blacks. All that stands now are communities and forests, of burnt matchsticks. H2O is a beautiful thing. It feeds and sustains all life on this planet. However, water was not our friend in British Columbia, Canada in 2021. No. The water you and I know every day was not the same water on that day of the floods. No, by a long shot. This water was angry. On that day, our rivers, our lakes, our dikes were no match for pushing back the rains. But it wasn't just the rain. We know what rain is here in British Columbia. But what we did not know was what is this thing we call atmospheric river? Let alone one after another after another. We had no warning systems that day. The warning system on that day was a loud knock on the door in the middle of the night, followed by someone shouting, get out now. That was the warning system. In a moment's notice, the rivers went from serene postcard moments something you'd see in a tourism commercial, to white water rapids, bursting banks, rerouting rivers, ripping out highways, tearing down bridges, swallowing up neighbors, and spitting out homes. It was that bad. It was a domino effect of destruction. Then we have our friends in the Sumas Prairie, in around the community of Abbotsford, British Columbia. They went from a beautiful day of grazing cows, tractors pulling, roosters calling, to a night of chaos and screams in a moment's minute. Now, life in the Sumas all about, came all about saving the animals, seeking high ground, using escape routes, now riverbeds, vehicles swimming for their lives in what was the rebirth of an old lake. Today, Come hell or high water, we for one are going to deliver and we need you to pitch in. Let's do something incredible today. Let's feel good for change. Because we cannot let this become, not on our watch, another cold case disaster in BC's history.
Patrick Jr. from New Toronto and Merritt, BC. I'm doing prayer, dance, and prayers for hell or high water, all my relations. My name is Greg Gerard. I am your Cobro founder with my brother Colin of the award-winning travel and adventure website, acanadatravel.com. My brother and I are small town and tourism consultants and very, very proud Canadians. And we wear both of those badges very proudly right here on my shoulder. In 2021, my brother and I were on evacuation alert three times and evacuation order once because of the BC fires and floods. Yes, we too were chased out of the town by the very same river, which for decades brought the community of Merritt so much adventure, so much joy, fun, and music. That very same river, it turned rogue on us that day of the floods, washing away a section of the community, forging new river routes where neighborhoods once stood and ripping up the infrastructure like there was no tomorrow. It turns out, there was no tomorrow. When the waters finally subsided and the infrastructure was back in place, to some degree, we got the okay to come back home. We were one of the lucky ones because we had a home, a job, and a life to come back to. Fast forward to today, 
almost four months later after the floods and nine months later since the fires burned down our forests in the village of Lytton and Monte Creek. Thousands of British Columbians are still displaced to this very day. So many are still couch surfing across Canada. How can we possibly forget about these neighbors and families so easily? How could we leave these communities in such a bad spot? We shouldn't, we wouldn't, we couldn't, and we can't. This is a real life devastation. It is urgent. It is our and your backyard. Tonight we are aiming to raise three million dollars with your help. Yes, you heard us right. Rebuilding families and communities is not cheap. A group of four of us, Melvina White, Kenny Hess, my brother Colin and myself, decided enough was enough and we wanted to do something about it. Today, with the help of over 40 international, national, regional, and local musicians, five celebrity hosts, and a boatload of federal, provincial, and regional dignitaries, as well as many locals agree with us. Enough is enough. And they want to do something about it too. And we have come together, and now it's up to you. Every two hours, a new host will lead you through the telethon. For my hour, of hosting, I want you to buckle in and get ready because we are about to settle the score with the 2021 BC fire and floods. Yes, we are going to go 12 rounds with this bad boy and we're going to win. The most costly severe weather event in Canadian history has met its match in Merritt, Lytton, Abbotsford, Princeton, Monte Creek and the affected First Nation communities. Surely our David and Goliath battle of recovery deserves your generosity. Let's start earning your love with our first musical performance. Sean Hogan is a CCMA, SCMA, and WCMA award-winning songwriter and roots country recording artist. And he will be performing his song appropriately titled, Come Hell or High Water, to kick off this very important event. Ajo apstuki spumukina. See what? 
Welcome back to the Hell or High Water Telethon. We will only take a minute. Oh, hold on. It's going to be two minutes. We're going to take two minutes of your time. For two minutes, we need you to focus Canada. We need you to concentrate because this part of the telethon is about you, the viewer. There are many ways you can help families and gift the telethon before 10 p.m. tonight. One you can go to the www.hellorhighwater.ca website and donate directly. Sounds simple. Two, you can call the number on your screen and talk to a real person. Imagine that. Three, you can text to give on your phone by using our text to give numbers. At the Hell or High Water fundraiser, you can give in many different ways. You can give a lot, you can give a little, it all counts. And get this, when you give, you can select which community you would like your gift to go towards, including, just check it off, Merritt, Abbotsford, Princeton, Monte Creek, Lytton, just check those off and you're ready to go. Or you can donate to them all and the funds will be divided up amongst them appropriately. Plus, you get a tax receipt, no harm, no foul, everyone wins, you did good, enjoy the show. It's that simple. One question after you've donated. Did you pay it forward? This fundraising thing everyone's talking about works a lot better when you help and participate. So please go to your social media pages and challenge your friends and your families to match or beat your donation. Tell them about this cool telethon going on right now on websites, social media, and TV, and they've got, you know, a little bit of a wacky hose at it too. Bring them on. If we all did this one little gesture, thousands of families would be a better and happier place. The largest disaster in Canadian history deserves Canada's attention. We cannot let this be swept under the rug, filed away, like another OL BC cold case disaster. Not on our watch, not gonna happen. We are better than that. We are proud British Columbians and Canadians. For the next 12 hours, we will be more Canadian than ever before. We will sing, we'll talk, we'll smile, and yes, we're going to cry. We will ask others to phone, text, and donate online. The words please, thank you, and sorry will be repeated many times over tonight because that is how Canadians roll when we want to get things done. To get the latest telethon totals, please go to www.hellorhighwater.ca website. Book author Courtney C. Stevens once wrote, you meet Noah after the flood, you think, what a brave visionary man. You meet Noah before the flood and you're thinking, huh? A little bit of a nut job. Perspective and timing matters. Please do not judge our communities on what you cannot see or possibly understand. But judge us today on what you are seeing in our music, in our stories, and our resiliency. Listen to the messages and the urgency. Think about it. It's quite truly amazing that four small communities have the determination to host an event of this size and magnitude after a major disaster. Everyone cheers for the underdog. Surely you can cheer for the underdogs on this special day. The floods and fires have gone, and so has the media. Out of sight, out of mind, I guess it's that sort of concept. 
the thousands of still displaced families of Merritt, Lytton, Abbotsford, Princeton, Monte Creek, and the surrounding First Nation communities are no longer part of the media news cycle. They're not even part of the discussion. Yet the problems are bigger today than they ever have been. The stories are sadder today than they ever have been. The loss is greater and yet nothing. Sometimes I got to wonder, like, did I miss a memo somewhere along the line? So it looks like it is up to us again, you, us, me, musicians, everybody, to make a difference and to send a strong message. Let's all participate in being part of change. Nudging, poking, sharing this telethon, paying it forward, challenging, and or trash talking with your friends if that's what it's going to take to change lives. Do whatever it takes. Join our cause for good. And why we're all going to do this, you're probably going to ask, you're probably asking me right now, simple. Because you are Canadians. Many of you call British Columbia your home province. It is what we do. We look after each other. Our next performance is two times CMAA award winners, Jetty Road, one of Australia's country music's most beloved trios. 2022 marks 17 years together as a band on a journey that are really kicked off busking on the streets of Australia's legendary Tamworth Country Music Fest. Can you believe it? They were busking at one time. They've come a long way since those days and recently achieved an Australian Recording Industry Associated Music Awards number one country album. They've taken their music to the world stage with multiple world tours, including multiple tours to Canada, kudos. They have even recorded two studio albums to Canada, kudos. And they were thrilled when they asked to take part in the Hell or High Water fundraiser. So please, let's welcome to the stage, Jetty Road. Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Well, it's Jetty Road here. Uh, all from the Australia, all the way from Australia, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, we just want to say we love you, Canada. You, you mm. feel like family to us. You're our second home. And we have so many fond memories of touring in BC and especially playing at the Merritt Mountain Fest yeah. um, in 2011. It was such a good time, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was. was. Um, now, when we heard about these devastating fires and floods that you guys in BC have had, our hearts went out to you. Uh, we know all too well mm. um, the effect that these things can have um, on communities, wildlife. Um, yeah, it's it's devastating. So we jumped at the chance to uh, get on yes. and we wanted to play for you and say hi and just put the shout out to everyone around that please to give generously. Donate, donate, donate as much as you can. It yeah. really means a lot. And it may, means a lot, but also every dollar counts in cases like this. So please yeah. give generously um, to hellorhighwater.ca and we hope to be back in your area of the world one day soon. See ya. See ya. We're gonna do a song now that we wrote on one of our tours throughout Canada, I think it was in 2010, and uh, we wrote this with one of your very own, uh, Mr. Jason McCoy from The Road Hunters. Hey. This one's called I'm a Dreamer. One, two, here we go. Uh -huh.
I'm sure you have all heard about the Abbotsford flooding in the Sumas Prairie. The region experienced an unheralded three atmospheric rivers. What, what's an atmospheric river, you might say? Well, we had the same question. We had no idea what it was until, until the floods came. Let me give you a little insight. An atmospheric river is a long and narrow stream. It's a formation which forms in the atmosphere. It's very much like, uh, let's say, a huge river in the sky. And it's holding a large amount of water, waiting for the right conditions to drop a great volume of rain in a short period of time. This phenomenon creates great quantities of rain that can create massive flooding. And this is what is Abbotsford experience. In Abbotsford, just in the month of November, 540 millimeters of rain fell on the British Columbia Valley. You see, Abbotsford is a floodplain held together by a series of dikes, which on this day and on this night, it could not hold back the water. Lindsay Lockhart and her family, they work a small farm in the Sumas Prairie. She joins me tonight in the virtual studio to share her frightening experiences and challenges in a program we are calling the people of the BC fires and floods. This is a true story. It's raw. We didn't put any spin on it. It's all on the table on this one. This next story is one full of challenges, comebacks, love, and sorrow. It's time to get real people. Hi everyone. Um, I just wanted to jump on here. A lot of people have been reaching out. Uh, it's been really, um, a really hard couple days. Um, we just got word, however, good news that our horses are okay. I was worried and kind of up all night wondering about them. Um, we're functioning on a couple hours of sleep, so <laughs> I'm a little emotional and all over the place, but, um, we have our goats here with us at my parents. We've got Millie, um, one of our pigs. We have our cats, we have our dog. And now hearing that the horses are okay it was a huge um, sigh of relief. We've been watching all the local, the press, live pref, press conferences and talking to neighbors. Um, there is one neighbor left in the Arnold area that I'm in contact with. Things seem to be getting better, but Kind of minute by minute, minute by minute, things change. Um, it was a very, uh, very traumatic um, evacuation, to say the least. We had to leave Murphy because um, it was like minute by minute changing, and if we stayed any longer, there was we almost didn't make it out. Ben and I, so um, we didn't really have a choice. Um, so I'm hoping that he's found higher ground, but I don't know. Um, we're just kind of waiting to see what happens over the next day or two, and I'm assuming it's going to be a couple days before we can go back to the house, but it sounds like our house is underwater. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to process everything, but 
thank you all for reaching out. It means a lot. Um, we're just um, taking it minute by minute at this point. Our kids are good. They have really no idea what's going on, so that's a good thing. But yeah, um, we appreciate all the love and support. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay, for joining us here on the Hell or High Water Telethon to share your Abbotsford, BC flood stories and experiences as a special guest on a feature that we are calling the people of the BC fires and floods. So, Lindsay, let's get right to it. So maybe you can introduce ourselves, yourself to us a little bit and tell us something special about life on uh, on the Sumas Prairie. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Lindsay Lockhart. I have a young family. I have two young kids and my husband. And we actually moved to the prairie this year, this summer in June. So we um, searched for years and years and years, about seven years for a property that we could uh, call our forever home and raise our kids on. Um, a little hobby farm um, was kind of the dream and we finally found it and we're very happy. So that, that sort of leads us back to to the days that we or that we all have very vivid in our memories is let's go back to the morning on the Sumash Prairie of the flood and maybe you can walk us through uh, the first few days of the flood and maybe share of how it all unfolded and, and your story behind it. Yeah, so like I said, we just moved here in June. So we we weren't familiar with like a rainy season or anything like that here on the prairie. We were aware that we moved to a flood pl floodplain and we were aware that there was floods in the 90s, but we have family that lives on the prairie and it, it, we weren't even fathoming um, anything like this could happen. So on the Monday, though it, it was raining very, very heavily on the weekend before, and we were kind of just um, naive and oblivious and just thought like, oh, our front yard will have some pooling of water and stuff. So we started kind of moved the horses around a little bit because the backfield started to um, have a little bit of a, a channel through it, but nothing that made us worry at all. So on the Monday evening, I got a call from my uncle who lives on the prairie on McDermott, and he said, you guys should maybe put a plan in place to get your animals evacuated if possible, just to be safe. And it was then that I was like, what is this? Is this actually something that we have to worry about? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, I'm not sure, but just in case, then at least you have a plan in place for when something does happen. If it does, I don't have a trailer for my horses. So I called whoever I could and I had three people jump on board to say, yep, we can come get your horses as soon as possible. Let us know when and where. And by that time already at 6.30 on Monday, no trailer could get into us. Whoa. Everything was already, all the roads and everything were already um, uh, basically overflowed, uh, over flooded. Um, and we kind of knew that because on Monday when I went to pick up my daughter from school, she goes to um, McMillan in East Abbotsford. Um, getting home was already an issue in my truck. So I phoned my husband who was at work and he drives a car. And I said, if you're not going to get home, if you don't leave now, you're not getting your car home. And so he, that was 2.30 and he left. And we drove around for two hours trying to get find a way for him to get home. And we ended up having to leave his car at Arnold Church because even by then it was uh, too high for a car to get through. So Monday night, uh, we went to bed at about 1 and I just kind of checked the front yard. And um, it had the water had started to fill our front yard, but it, it was quite a ways um, from the house. So we weren't really concerned. And then at about 2.30, I woke up and it was about three quarters of the way up the yard, which, which was a huge difference. And so it was at that time that I woke my husband up and we started moving every day. So it was about 6 a.m. that um, the SWAT team came through. It was still pitch black. The SWAT team came through in their big um, truck, armor mm -hmm. truck, and went on the intercom and said, like, get your family out immediately, evacuate now over the PA system. And so it was a scary thing. So at that point, my husband and I looked at each other and we were like, oh my goodness, like this is, this is bad. Like we never really thought, we thought yeah. we'd be like stuck sheltered at home and be okay. But we were like, this is something that we have to be worried about. So I, my husband said, go grab the kids and the dog, get in the truck and I'll handle everything else. So he started like putting the pump in the, in the crawl space. He started kind of shutting off all of the electrical while I got the kids in the truck. And um, they, that was kind of traumatic for them because I ended up just like pulling them by their ankles out of the bed. Cause it was scary. Yeah. And um, 
I'm happy that it was dark at that point because they didn't, my kids didn't get to see uh, see the water. So yeah. they weren't as affected by it as some of the kids who I talked to that um, evacuated around like 9 a.m. where it was like clearly evident you could see everything. So we got the kids out. We dropped them off at my parents in Chilliwack, the kids and the dog. And that was at about 7 a.m. And then we turned around to come back for the animals because they were all locked in the barn because wow. we had no idea the extent of what it was going to be like. And um, we hit roadblocks coming back and the police actually didn't let us through. They, so we ended up finding a third roadblock that we just blew through because we were like, if we don't get home, our yeah. animals will die. They're locked in the barn. Like they don't have a shot. Like I didn't even, I was mad that I didn't think to just open all the barn doors just to give them a chance. Mm-hmm. So there was no option. We had to get back. So we got back and we, um, we have two horses that I evacuated. Like I ran along the side of the mountain and um, one of the neighbors who lives on the hill said like, you can bring them here for as long as you need. Um, So I did that. Luckily I had set that up on Monday night when I couldn't get the trailers in. Mm -hmm. And then um, we got, we have two potbelly pigs. I got, I managed to get one of them. The other one I didn't. Um, We ended up having to leave him because he just swam away. And I had known that pigs are good swimmers, so I was okay kind of leaving him. But um, uh, that was hard. But so we got one of our pigs. We got our two miniature goats. And we had to leave. Of course, we had 47 chickens at the time. So we put them all in the barn and just hoped hoped for the best. There was higher ground. And we threw kind of a bunch of hay bales in there and stuff, thinking like, if they need to get up on these, the, surely the water can't come up this high. While we were at my parents in Chilliwack, we had no idea what was going on because for three days we couldn't get back. And so it was just like this kind of, we were getting pictures from the neighbors who stayed on the hill who were kayaking down the road past people's homes, um, just kind of giving pictures to whoever they could. So based on the pictures, we thought that in the house, our prop, uh, it would be flooded up to about counter height. Yep. Um, on the main floor. So it was kind of this roller coaster of emotions like, okay, we were able to save most of our animals except our one pig and hoping he would be okay. And then seeing the damage to the home and just like it, it was a lot to handle. And then when we finally got back to the home, um, our pig ended up being okay. He must have swam to the neighboring neighbor's property and hung out on the top deck and just. Yep. So he made it, which was great. And the horses ended up being okay. Um, So we got back to the house at about day three, I think, um, on the Friday and just started gutting everything. So it came up about on the main floor. We have about a four and a half foot crawl. So it filled the crawl space. um, And that's where the furnace and the hot water tank and the built in back were all kind of ruined. But it came up about a foot on the main. So enough to do enough damage where it took all the flooring and take out all the drywall. So We got to that really fast and then got a whole bunch of fans and dehumidifiers in there. And then we got evacuated again for the second time. Oh, Um, boy. Yeah. So then at which time we were stuck in Chilliwack because they put the Tiger Dam up. So we were stuck in Chilliwack. I think that lasted a week. Um, Meanwhile, we were trying to get back and forth to feed our animals that were still here. And uh, we had... We were on my parents' city lot with our two goats, our two pigs, three Rottweilers from our neighbors, our dog, and our two cats. It was just like a gong show. Mm -hmm. Um, And then they ended up getting out at my parents' house while we were here at the farm doing demo. And it was just like animal animal control got involved. And it was, yeah, so it was a little bit of a nightmare. And um on top of it, when because the Tiger Dam and the highway were closed, we had to drive the three hours all the way around, three hours there and three hours back. So we had to go from Chilliwack through Agassiz, around through Mission and back to Abbotsford every morning and then do however much work we could until dark and then do the three hours back every night while our two kids stayed with my parents in Chilliwack. So it made for really long days. And the ups and downs of the first oh, yeah. river, then the second atmospheric river, then the third atmospheric river. Yeah. So what what is the situation now as uh, as you move through your recovery process? So we were back in our home. Um, we were very lucky. Uh, we got trades that 
came out immediately and um, helped us with drywall and putting our flooring in and everything like that. We had uh, some of our flooring was donated by End of the Roll in Abbotsford. Like we wow. had a bunch of people um, reach out and help us out. So that really helped with like the initial um, money needing to be spent for a new furnace and like all the major things that cost a lot of money that could get us back in our home quickly. So yep. we were really lucky in that sense. We had so much support. I wanted to send a huge um, thank you to Cody Lynn and Paige Manning and um, Traveland RV. Uh, Cody Lynn and Paige have been on the ground running since this happened and um, have just been a blessing for us and so many other people. Um, Paige and her husband Caleb actually came and disposed of all of our animals who had passed away for us. Um, and Cody Lynn has just been at the front lines um, communicating with us every day. Starting from uh, the days that we couldn't get back to our farm, she was communicating with her brother-in-law who stayed in the area, who was coming and feeding our animals and giving us pictures of our home. Um, and my cousins at Travel and RV um, dropped off an RV for us. So we no longer have to make the two and a half hour trek to Chilliwack two times a day or the 45 minutes to White Rock two times a day. We will start staying at our home and get our kids back to their routine, get Charlie back to school. So we are beyond thankful for all of your help. William Shakespeare once said, never be so busy as to not think of others. That's what we are going to do here is to think of others. And if you're busy, Life's a little chaos. Take a deep breath. Relax and enjoy us and the entertainment we have for you tonight. I am so big on this donor challenge concept. They're so fun to watch. It's interesting to see who puts it out there. They create innovative, innovative ways among groups to compete for a good cause. So it will come as no surprise when I tell you that my brother and I have challenged the tourism businesses and government tourism associates. Yep, we've come up. We're going to put the money where the mouth of our little company, the little company that could, a Canada Marketing Group. We donated $250, and we challenge every tourism business and government tourism association to match or beat our donation. This is another challenge between us, people tourism, and government-funded public tourism. And I know who I would bet on. We are fortunate to have many locals step up and tell their stories about the BC fires and floods. We're so lucky that they're going to let everything, emotions come out. We are also thankful to the many international, national, regional, and local dignitaries who are stepping up as well, representing their regions as they should. Our next guest is Dan Albus. He's a Conservative Member of Parliament for the riding of Central Okanagan and Similkameen, and Nicola. Dan is currently the Shadow Minister for Environment and Climate Change. He also represents the flooded regions of Merritt, BC, Canada. So let's welcome Dan Albus to our virtual stage. Hi everyone, Dan Albus here, speaking to you from Ottawa, where I just spoke in the House of Commons on behalf of Merritt, Princeton, and all of the other rural areas of British Columbia affected by the flooding. These small communities need funds to protect their water system from the threats of our changing climate, yet the aid that especially our rural communities need to survive, to rebuild, and hopefully move forward, moves so slowly. I'm fearful that many will fall through the cracks in bureaucracy, despite the fact that the users of these systems all pay taxes to the provincial and federal governments. Now, I'm doing all I can to try to improve and streamline these processes, and I'm hopeful in the days, weeks, and months going forward that as communities like Princeton and Merritt try to rebuild, the federal government in Ottawa will be there to support these communities. Now, that's a challenge we need to be up for as Canadians. And it's a challenge that the organizers of today's telethon are tackling head on to ensure that our fellow citizens 
are supported in their hour of need and that no one gets left behind. Now, failure is not an option for every one of these citizens who are facing a loss, extremely challenging time in British Columbia. And I know that if we all rally together, we can move from survive to thrive. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the organizers and all the artists that made this telethon possible. Amazing work. Thank you as well to the Rotary Club of, of Merit. As a fellow Rotarian, I appreciate the Rotarian commitment to service above self. Special appreciations for all of the local mayors and councillors, regional district directors, First Nation chiefs and council, and of course, my provincial and federal colleagues for all they've done to support their communities. Let's keep on it. November 2021 changed the lives of so many in British Columbia, and they need our help to rebuild their lives. So please, please consider donating during this telethon. And if you already have, thank you. I'll keep standing up for you in Ottawa. Let's keep doing what we can to make sure no one falls through the cracks. Let's work together. Oh my God. I am so excited about our next guest and the performance on so many different levels. I grew up with this band in my early teens. I bought their albums. I know the words of their songs, or I used to anyways. You know them as Chilliwack. This iconic band has released 12 albums, received 15 gold and platinum certifications, and produced hits like Lonesome Mary, Fly at Night, Arms of Mary, Baby Blue, Communication Breakdown, My Girl, and What You Gonna Do When I'm Gone. It's obvious Chilliwack is still winning over young classic rockers and delighting long-time fans now that you have just released their latest CD called There and Back. It's exciting. I had the pleasure of sitting down with Bill Henderson of Chilliwack in our virtual studio. And we talked about the band, the BC Fires and Floods, the fundraiser, and the story behind the song he is about to share with us today. It was a special moment for me to hear the Chilliwack story from the man himself, Bill Henderson. Please put your hands together, stomp your feet on the floor, get up off the couch, and welcome Bill Henderson, Chilliwack, and his special guests to our Hell or High Water virtual stage. Welcome to the Hell or High Water Telethon and Concert, Mr. Bill Henderson of the award-winning Canadian rock and roll band Chilliwack. Bill, let's dive right into it with our first question. All you, right. Jerry, Ed, and Gord have been busy lately. You've been connecting with your, this new big growing phenomenon with the young classic rockers. You're delighting us old guys with the, the longtime fans with your latest release there in Bat. Maybe you could tell us a little bit where the band's going and, and what's next for the band. Well, we, uh, you know, the band uh, started a whole long time ago. And uh, we, you know, this particular iteration has been together for quite a while now, a decade or so. And uh, actually with Jerry, been playing with Jerry since, uh, he's the drummer, right? Been playing with Jerry since 85. So he's, he, he, oh, he's missed one gig in the whole thing. And that was the last one we played, which was, he had COVID symptoms, right? He had symptoms. Okay. So like, uh, he couldn't do it. He would have would have come for sure. He's come sick, uh, you know, other times. And, yep. But, uh, you know, puking on his uh, floor, Tom, and still <laughs> keeping going, man. Because yep. yep. <laughs> that's what we do. We don't miss gigs. Yep. But uh, anyway, we're just, you know, we got a new, we got a, a vinyl release of There and Back. So There and Back was the first record Chilliwack ever made that was made for CD. Okay. So usually, you know, we, we had CD reissues of all of our vinyl. This time we're doing a vinyl reissue of our CD. And uh, and it's, uh, you know, one of the things we get into is a Chilliwack, what the meaning of the word Chilliwack is, like it's a, it's a, a word uh, from the Chilliwack people, the, the native people in that area, right? And uh, we used to think it meant uh, Valley of Many Streams, but found out that it means um, as far as your canoe can go. Oh, wow. Because that valley, which as we know, was flooded in November, you know, the Abbotsfords in that valley, the whole the whole Fraser Valley going all the way up to Chilliwack was all was wetlands, and some of it still is, but I guess it was 
I guess it was originally mainly wetlands with a lake in it and everything, right? And and uh, so you could take your canoe all through there. You could fish. You could go all the way up to Chilliwack. After you got to Chilliwack, you couldn't go any farther. That was it. So as far as your canoe can go is Chilliwack. You know, and so far, this band, Chilliwack, our canoe is still afloat. So we, we have not beached it yet. And <laughs> we'll see how far we go. Yeah, yeah. And I love that album cover. Cool. Yeah, yeah. it's fun. Yeah. yeah, with the with using your guitars as paddles is brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that was a, a local guy on Salt Spring here that did that, um, John Malcolm. Okay, great artist. Yeah. So, Bill, you saw um, you. I guess you could. It's pretty hard to 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 not see it, but the devastation, the destruction, the havoc, the BC fires and floods have had on on a lot of the the southern interior here in BC, and of course the mainland that we just covered there, uh, Merritt, Lytton, Prince Abbotsford. So. What are you seeing or what did you hear or what are you feeling uh, as you watch this all unfold as, uh, as our province was being flooded and burnt down? Yeah. Well, it's scary. Yeah. Um, it's very scary. And uh, we live, I live on Salt Spring Island and it's uh, in a rain shadow, which means at least in the summertime, we get very little rain. So for the last, oh, I don't know, like six, eight years, it's been getting really dicey. We've had, the, the, we've had, um, Orange skies, a lot have been burning around Nanaimo and stuff like that. We we haven't. It hasn't hit our island. Small ones have hit the island, but not a major wildfire yet. So you know that that we're very aware of that, and um, it's it's uh, we're doing what we can to mitigate. You know, uh, uh, make sure that doesn't happen. Um, I'm lucky the the woods around me have got a lot of uh, salal in them, okay. which uh, so slow will slow fire down. Uh, but you know this is happening, and it's happening everywhere, and it, it is scary. There's no two ways about it. We yeah. we got to do we got to do something. Yeah, we got to clean up our act. <laughs> uh, uh, you you wouldn't find uh, somebody to agree with you more. Um, why, you, you know, Bill? There's it, when we were first reaching out to you, we were very very honored. Uh, for myself, I've been a big fan for for decades. Why was it so important for you and the boys of Chilliwack to participate in this uh, the Hell or High Water fundraiser? Um, I feel like, uh, and I think we we all feel that, um, you know, uh, we're not as young as we were. We're not we're not just into our career and 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 just uh, trying to make the most of it and all of that. Um, I really feel a strong need to help. Uh, our communities mm -hmm. and uh, I just feel that way and there's not a lot that I can do I don't have a lot this is these are my skills music is that's my skill right yeah. and and so if and the way I look at it is you know I've thought about it quite a bit like the I, what 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 am I doing that's of any value what 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 is it about music that is valuable is there is there real value and, and you know I really think that uh, you know what we do is we we you know people who come to our shows they go away happy. Yeah. That that's that's what we that's what we do. We we try to have a good time, and they have a good time, and it's super super important. That's our community that evening it was super important to us that they have a great time, and and you know I believe that people who who feel good make better decisions, and so when you go further into life, into how they respond to things in their life, if they are happy, if they feel good. Then, then they're in a, a much clearer-minded position. You know, they're not yeah. so. We're so beleaguered right now with all this crap that's happening. Right? We're just like under so much pressure. Everybody, and uh, I think music has a role to play in all of that. Where we can go, whoa, let's just relax for a while. Let's dance. Let's sing. Let's feel good. You know. Yeah. No, I, 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 music is very powerful. It's, I think it's extremely powerful. So hence why we're really excited to have you. So Bill, is there anything you would like to say to Canadians before we let you go? And if you would be so kind, uh, share with us a little bit of the background about the song uh, that we're about to play uh, from your group at Chilliwack. Maybe you could give us a little bit of insight on that. Right. Okay. So yeah, the song I wrote about eight years ago, my wife and I wrote it. It's called Take Back This Land. Um, and that title, Take Back This Land, is, uh, has become, those words have become uh, a part of our culture, and, and they're not, not always what I meant when I wrote that. When you listen to the first verse of the song, 
you you hear what it you hear what the song's really about and and it's about you know when it comes to 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 democracy which is a a word in that song mm -hmm. uh and uh bob rock the producer he said wow man you wrote a song with democracy in it it sounds good <laughs> 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 how the hell did you do that yeah. anyway uh democracy when i think of democracy i think of i think of um you know um Proportional representation. I think of people, I think of, let's not have an opposition party. Let's mm. have everybody working together. How about this is a council of wise people from all over Canada. And, and <clears throat> we're not pitting ourselves against each other. Proportional representation means that when you, whatever party you vote for, uh, the number of votes that go to that party equals the number of seats, not equals, but you know it's used to determine the number of seats that that party has. So you're going to have more parties, and you're going to have to work together, kids. So let's work together. That's what we need to do, right? And that's the song is really coming from that place. It's about community. Very, very well said. It's, it is about community. Uh, Mr. Bill Henderson of the rock and roll iconic band. Uh, producer of many beautiful singles uh thank you so much and many record golden beautiful albums thank you so much for your time bill <laughs> thank you for sharing your expertise and thank you very much for participating in the hell or high water hey guys okay, from all Let's... of us our heart goes out to you thank you all right man thank you and thank you for doing this it's so great you're doing it i really appreciate the opportunity thank you excellent
Margaret Mead, a famous anthropologist, once said, never believe that a few caring people can't change the world, for indeed, that's all who ever have. When we were discussing the Hell on High Water fundraiser, we wanted to make sure to work with a nonprofit who works directly with the local population, directly with the people affected by fires and floods. No middleman. No red tape, no commission on donations. We don't, we don't want anything to do with that. That is why we are proud to have partnered with the Rotary Club of Merit. Together, the participating Rotaries and nonprofits in different communities, and now the group at the Hell or High Water Fundraiser, are combining resources and fundraiser efforts to raise $3 million for the communities of Abbotsford, Merritt, Princeton, Lytton, and Monty Creek. To explain the donation process further, I was lucky enough and happy to sit down with Leslie Lucy of the Rotary Club of Merit and discuss their role on the Hell or High Water fundraiser. So please, put your hands together and let's welcome Leslie Lucy to the virtual studio. Welcome to the Hell or High Water fundraiser, Leslie Lucy of the Rotary Club of Merit. We're so glad to have you here, Leslie, and we're so proud to be working with the Rotary Club of Merit. So maybe, Leslie, for some of the people out there that are watching from across Canada and across globally, maybe you could maybe introduce yourself a bit and, and tell us about the Rotary Club of Merit. So um, thank you, Greg. I'm absolutely pleased to be here as well. Um, the Rotary Club of Merit is a small but mighty, mighty group of um, 14 people. And um, they've done a lot of work in this community. I've been here for about five years. And when I first moved to Merit, the one thing I really noticed was all the Rotary signs all over the place on the Rotary Park, the Rotary Bike Park, and um, how much good work the community has done. So Leslie, could you please tell us Mm -hmm. the role that the Rotary Club of Merit will play in the Hell or High Water fundraiser, because it's an, it's an important part to the fundraiser, is, is the role that you're playing. So I think it's important that we tell everyone exactly uh, what the Rotary Club of Merit is doing. Well, it's been pretty exciting, Greg. We've been here right from um, day one when it was still a concept. Mm -hmm. So to have seen what has um, happened, what um, the organization, the amount of work that's gone into organizing this from just before Christmas until now is absolutely phenomenal. 
And the Merit Club is looking after the donations. So the donations will come into Merit, and then from there they'll be dispersed out to the various communities. So Princeton, Lytton, Abbotsford, and of course ourselves, Merit. So it's it, it, and it, it's it's quite a process because you have them, from my understanding, coming from a whole bunch of different air, different ways of coming into the fund. So you're you're like navigating all of this, right? Oh, it's been crazy. You know, we've had money from uh, as far away as France, which um, is pretty mind boggling. That, That's amazing. Um, it is um, the northern United States, right across Canada. Yeah. So one of the big advantages of the Hell or High Water Funder is that the people can select which community they would like their funds to go to, which is really sort of different than most. Because when you do you do donate, you can select Merritt, Lytton, Prittens, or Abbotsford, or all which means that they would be divided evenly between those four. So maybe um, can they have their funds divided up between all these communities? So my question is, Leslie, is please share with us a bit about the nonprofits that we have partnered with and you are partnering with with participating in dispersing these funds to each community. It's three different Rotary groups um, and the um, Community Foundation of um, South Okanagan Similkameen. The Community Foundation of South Okanagan Similkameen is taking care of the Princeton funds. Okay. And the Princeton, from there, they'll flow back into Princeton. And then um, one of the Kamloops Rotary Clubs is taking care of the Lytton money. And, of course, Kamloops, uh, Merritt Rotary is taking care of the Merritt money. And then an Abbotsford Rotary Club is taking care of the Abbotsford money. You know, yep. so. That sounds like, like an all-star team. You know what? It is. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. also um, with these, and just to clarify, is there's also, um, there's the areas in between the communities, like the, the First Nation communities, the Highway communities, the Lytton First Nations. Mm -hmm. These are also involved as well? Yes. Brookmere and Tulamine. You know, so Tulamine's just outside of Princeton. Brookmere's just outside of Merritt. Highway 8 corridor. There was a lot of ranchers and um you know, there was some money just came down from the government for farmers, but it didn't include ranchers. And um, and the ranchers, you know, some of them, it's the land is gone. It's not just it's not just their home and their buildings that are gone. Their land is gone too. It's I don't know how you put land back. Yeah, how do how do you recover from that? <laughs> it's I mean, uh, and, you know, and and I mean, their livelihood is gone. Their future is gone. You know, um, everything they've ever worked for in their life is just gone. You know. Wow. Well. What is the process to apply for funds once the funds are dispersed? So just maybe for the people out there that are donating right now, and boy, oh boy, all of you viewers, please be donating if you can right now. Well, each community has their own method. So I'm going to start with Merit. That's the one I'm most familiar with. So Merit, we have an application process. And we're working out that right now. So we don't know exactly what the scope of that will be. We'll broaden it quite a bit. It might not be only homeowners it it might not be only tenants or it might be you know we we just don't know until we see how much money we have so whatever amount of money we get is going to be significant to how many people we are able to help and how we're able to help them you know okay. so Okay, yeah. so it, it sounds like it's it, you've got your sort of parameters in yeah. place, you've got your framework in place, and then with each individual nonprofit and their disbursement process, it's pretty much tailored to that region, which is it, which is yeah. what it should be, right? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. yeah. And, and and that's the beauty is that unlike most uh, fundraisers that we've watched on TV or in the past, this one is quite a bit different because it's not it's for small little communities doing this. I mean, it is, uh -huh. is it's quite amazing when you look at the scope of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, um, and, and we've caught the attention um, right across Canada of, yeah. you know, because, um, it, it, yeah, it's amazing the amount of phone calls I've had, the amount of, um, I guest appeared on various rotary meetings across Canada because people want to know how we're doing. I agree. So, I agree. so yeah. why is, why is it, the hell or high water so important right now based on what you are hearing from the communities why why is our here's one of the things is that we have out of sight out of mind is a big thing if it's mm -hmm. out of sight everyone thinks we've solved our problems well that's not the case you and i both know that it's actually compounded it's actually worse now we're sort of identifying some of these big needs assessments so why is the hell or high water fundraiser so important right now at this time of the recovery process 
Well, you've, you've hit part of it right on the head there, Greg, is that, you know, we've dropped out of the uh, attention of the media. And so people just aren't, aren't um, seeing that there's still a need here. And as the ground thaws, it's getting worse. It's getting worse because there's um, things that people didn't even know were wrong. You know, they're sitting in their house that they thought they could live in now, and all of a sudden it's starting to settle and creak and groan and, oh, and okay. sinking into the mud on them, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and then they've got the mold problem too. That you know now that now that it's not cold anymore, that the mold well, once you get that mold in there, I don't know what you do with it. Oh man, that that's scary. Yeah, you know, so so just getting the word out there that this still is a serious serious problem, and these people really need help, and you know we hope to raise significant dollars to help these people but it doesn't matter how much we raise it's not going to be enough no. you know so we just need to keep this going and going and going and going until we can help these people get their lives back together i just want to make sure that's out there the telethon ends doesn't mean that that help is ending we want we want to make sure that we continue with that effort it doesn't mean the need ends either. <laughs> exactly. The need, the need is, we've got a, you're exactly right. The need is huge. And we're, we're asking all of you watching uh, to challenge your friends, to, to talk to your people, to, to do co-worker challenges, to do industry challenges, because together we can make a big difference. Before we mm -hmm. let you go, Leslie, is there anything else you would like to share with us and our audience about uh, the Hell or High Water fundraiser and the the excellent work that the Rotary is doing to be part of this. You know, I am so grateful for everybody and everything that has come together to help out. I was one of the fortunate people that was not affected by the flood, but that to me means that that means that I have a responsibility to help people who were affected by the flood. Just because I wasn't affected doesn't mean that it lets me off scot-free. This mm -hmm. is my community. This is where I grocery shop. This is, you know, where I tend to spend my time until my last breath. So, you know, it, uh, it's, it's just, we just want to put it back together and see people, see people back healthy and happy and, and um, back on their feet again. So, Every little bit helps, every little bit. It just absolutely doesn't matter how much it is. It, the $20 from the grandchildren is as significant as the $100,000 that we received. Exactly, exactly. Very wise words, Leslie. And again, uh, let's give a good virtual round of applause to Leslie Lucy of the Rotary Club of Merit, who is joining us today in our virtual studio here. And we look forward to continue the great work you do, Leslie. We look forward to hopefully making a dent and working with you and all the partners involved. And I'd like to give a shout out to everyone at the Rotary. Uh, thank you very much from the communities of Aberford, Prince Finn, Merritt, and Lytton, as well as all the sponsors and the people involved. So again, Leslie, thank you for your work. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for coming online and educating all our viewers. And uh, let's go, let's go, let's go make a difference. And thank you, Greg, for everything you and your crew have done in the last Thanks. few months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie Lucy, for spending some time with us and explaining how we are going to disperse this funds properly, ethically, and fairly. There's not going to be any strings, no spin, no catch. It's directly going to go to the affected families of the fires and floods. Which brings us to our next guest. Throughout her musical career, songwriting has been an integral part of Patricia Conroy's success. From her debut album, Blue Angel, it became apparent songwriting was in her blood. She crafted hits like Direction of Love, Keep Me Rockin', Bad Day for Trains, and I Don't Want to Be the One. Patricia Conroy is a multi BCCMA and CCMA award winner, including Best Album of the Year and Independent Female Artist of the Year. Lately, Patricia has been writing with many of Canada's biggest country music stars, like Megan Patrick, Michelle Wright, Jimmy Rankin, Emerson Drive, Aaron Burchett, and Beverly Mahood. To name a few, and just to only a few, because there's a lot more, but let's put our virtual hands together and welcome Patricia Conroy to our virtual stage here at the telephone. Hey everybody, this is Patricia Conroy, singer, songwriter, lover of country music. And uh, I grew up in Eastern Canada, but my country music career started in Western Canada, in Vancouver. And in those early years uh, and to this day, 
Uh, I've toured all over British Columbia and every small town, every big city. And I am truly, truly sorry about all the devastation from fires and flooding. And very happy that some wonderful people and friends of mine have put this telethon together uh, to raise money to help those folks who really lost everything. Uh, and we'll never get it back, but we can help a little bit. So we're asking for you to donate whatever you can. And uh, I'm sure the number's there and the, the website is there. And um, please help us um, and help them. And we love you and thank you for that. And all the best to everybody. I'll sing you a song. All that you could hold against me But you hold my hand What makes no sense to me You say you understand When I try to cut loose and let go You just take a little tighter happy to see all of you joining us here at the Hell or High Water fundraiser. Some of you are watching the telephone on our partnered websites. Thank you. While others are engaging with the telethon on our participating social media channels. That's cool as well. And then there are those of you watching us on TV. It sounds pretty much like we got it all covered. We are broadcasting from the beautiful Hubcast studios here in Vancouver, BC, Canada. You can watch this event on three websites at any time today from now until 10 p.m. This telethon can be viewed on the websites acanadatravel.com, experiencenickelvalley.com, and of course, the hellerhighwater.ca website. For those of you who want to participate, engage, and maybe interact with others during this telethon, we got you covered there too, because you can chat along with our telethon ambassadors on any one of our two social media pages, Experience Nickel Valley and A Canada Travel on Facebook. You can find quick links to all of these websites and social media pages on our Hell or High Water website. 
do these social media pages a solid and please follow them as well. For those of you snuggle up on the couch, enjoying a lazy Sunday, hanging out with us, and like the viewing experience on your television set, well, we got you covered there too. Your luck. You can watch this telethon on selected Shaw Spotlight channels serving British Columbia. So let it be known that during this event, our moods will swing with each song and each story. There will be times dancing, singing, laughter, but there will be moments of tears and sobbing as each chapter of this story, it's not a happy one, but here's the good news, here's what we could do. Maybe tonight, if we all work together, we have an opportunity to write the last chapter with a happy ending. So please, please give, please gift, please care. I'm very honored to introduce you to a very special international guest to the event. Our next guest has been a part in the tourism recovery process for countries devastated by disasters. He has put together many recovery plans and has brought governments and NGOs together to rebuild from the ground up. Chris Flynn is currently the executive chairman of the World Tourism Association for Culture and Heritage and he's based out of Australia. It is a position that requires liaison at the most senior levels of government, industry and academia. With over 36 years experience in international tourism working in a wide range of countries across four continents, Chris has an intimate knowledge of the industry and the requirements needed to identify critical trends that have the potential to influence development and expansion. Chris is often requested to speak at high profile conferences and events and or provide insights to leading news media channels. His expertise is also sought by leading international universities and faculty. So please welcome a mentor, a role model, and a friend of A Canada Travel, Mr. Chris Flynn of the World Tourism Association for Culture and Heritage to the Virtual Hell or High Water Studio. G'day and greetings from Sydney, Australia. My name is Chris Flynn. I am the executive chairman and founder of the World Tourism Association for Culture and Heritage, an organization that was formed to better protect and preserve the increasingly fragile cultural and heritage assets that exist around the world. Having spent many years um, traveling around the world, predominantly in the South Pacific and Mekong region, I was becoming increasingly concerned at the negative impact tourism was having on local communities and local ethnic tribes and cultures. This was due to irresponsible policies, irresponsible practices, and largely um, exploitation, where as an industry, we were prepared to take, but not give back. So in my opinion, something had to be done. And I was really shocked to find that there was no organization in the world that existed at that time that was focused on the protection and preservation of cultural and heritage assets. So it was that in mind that I launched the World Tourism Association for Culture and Heritage. And today we have offices and representatives around the world. In fact, on our advisory board, we have more than 400 years of senior executive board level and academic experience to support the industry to support communities and to support governments make the right choices to ensure that we better protect and preserve these fragile assets. Being from Australia, I'm very familiar, of course, with fire and flood and the devastation it can cause uh, to property and of course to people. Um, I myself, some years ago, were affected by the bushfires here in the Blue Mountains and had to evacuate my home. Luckily for me, um, I didn't lose my property, uh, my family were safe. But I'll never forget how it felt. I'll never forget the smoke, the heat, as the fire got literally to the end of my street. And what, I, what looked like black snow uh, falling on the house and on my garden. And of course, it's not snow, it's cinder. It's uh, the very thing that 
creates these fires, that moves these fires forward. So for me to be part of this amazing event and to support this cause is really a great honor. Today, I want to share with you an experience that I had uh, whilst working in the South Pacific. This is back in 2009. Um, this isn't about fire and flood. This is about a tsunami, a tsunami that hit the islands of Samoa, both Western Samoa and American Samoa, and literally devastated and decimated a people and its community. What happened was a huge earthquake occurred under the ocean and it sent four waves crashing into the southern uh, part of Western Samoa, where I was doing some work. Um, I was on the ground within four days of it happening. And what I saw, what I witnessed, what I experienced was truly devastating, very emotional. The people I met, how they'd been affected was, was overwhelming. You see, when a crisis happens to a community like Samoa, where there's only a small population, it affects everybody. What made it even worse in this particular case is that it happened around 7.30 in the morning. And at that time, either the school children were on their way to school or after the alarms had sounded, they were running back to their home when their waves hit. So the majority of people who were sadly taken that day were children. And of course, as we know, in a community where you lose children, particularly on that scale, it's, uh, it's unimaginable. I spent about a week on the island meeting with government officials, aid agencies, and the heads of local communities um, that exist around the island. It was important to have these conversations because one of the critical aspects of recovery in, the, in this particular instance was to develop strategy, a tourism strategy, that would allow them to move forward quickly uh, or, and as efficiently as possible. You see, tourism is the mainstay of the Samoan economy. So it's important that we, uh, that we basically put measures in place and got funding for it that will allow us to do that. I then returned to Australia, but I returned with the promise that I would go back to Samoa as soon as possible with a team of experts. And these were people, experts in tourism planning, strategy, communications, marketing, um, and of course, positioning. One of the key aspects when you're affected by crisis is the perception around the world of whether it is safe to go there or not. So rebranding and positioning and communication were critical aspects of this. Particularly when you're isolated, like in the middle of the South Pacific, how do you get accurate information to the rest of the world, to news channels, to the industry, to give them an understanding and an update on where you're at and how you're progressing? Well, this was a critical part of the planning that we did. So I returned with the, with the team. We held an impromptu conference so that we could meet the affected people directly and we could have an open and honest discussion on how we could move forward. Once we had determined and once we'd been around the island and assessed the damage with these various different agencies, um, we all returned back to Australia and New Zealand to begin the process of developing this strategy. I returned to Samoa. It was just before Christmas in 2009. I'll never forget it. I, I missed my daughter's uh, school pantomime, but that was fine. You know, as I said earlier, the most affected people on the island were children. They were the ones that had lost their lives. Their families were missing them. So it didn't really matter what time of year it was for me. Um, I got on that plane. I took the strategy and I met with the deputy prime minister and we went through it together. And I'm so pleased that he was uh, overwhelmed by it. And we got instant government support and industry buy-in for the development of that strategy. Once we had that, we could then go knocking on the doors that we needed to knock on. You see, without a plan, without a strategy, you're not gonna get funding. And it doesn't matter what kind of crisis you're dealing with. If you do not have funds, you're not gonna recover or the process of recovery will take so much longer. So with this strategy in hand, with this plan in hand, and with the Deputy Prime Minister by my side, we went to see the High Commission of Australia, the High Commission of New Zealand, and the various different agencies to secure the funds that we needed to help the recovery process. Today, of course, Samoa 
is just like any other beautiful Pacific island. They're flourishing and uh, their tourism economy is, uh, is well. The point I'm making now is the fact that the reason for hella high water is so that we can all give. We can all give something. It doesn't matter how, how big or how small it is. It all helps. Because as I said, with, without funding, you cannot recover. And without community, without understanding, without support for each other, you can't recover. So please, please give. Give generously. Give whatever you can. It all helps. I want to wish all of you, everyone who's put this wonderful event together, I wish you success. I wish the recovery process to be speedy, quick, and I hope that soon your lives will return to normal. It's been a great honor for me to be part of this event. So I wish you well. All the best from Australia. We had a great chance to catch up to Mr. Chris Buck at the Grand Ole Opry for a quick message that he wanted to share with the BC Fire and Flood families. In 2017, his debut self-titled album, Chris Buck Band, and then his second album, which happened in 2019, all in all, it has combined for over five top 40 singles and over 13 million streams. He and his band, have performed across the country on some of Canada's biggest festival stages, including Boots and Hearts, Rock and River Music Fest, the Calgary Stampede, and Manitoulin Country Fest. Chris, from the Grand Old Opry, is here to send us a quick message of hope and encouragement. Chris Buck here. Uh, I'm down in Nashville, Tennessee, actually just outside the Grand Old Opry. My thoughts and prayers are with everyone in Merritt in the Lower Mainland. I've heard about all the devastation from the floods, and it absolutely breaks my heart. Uh, anyone listening to this, if you guys can go to hellerhighwater.ca and make a donation, that would mean the world to me. Um, such great people behind this, and my thoughts and prayers are with everyone back home. Have a great day. Our next guest is Jackie Tagger and Kevin Falcon of the BC Liberal Caucus. Jackie is the BC Liberal MLA for the Fraser and Nicola. She was elected as the MLA in 2013, 2017, and 2020. She currently serves right now as the Assistant Deputy Speaker. Kevin Vulcan, who joins Jackie, is the newly elected leader of the BC Liberal Party as of 2022. He was a member of the Legislative Assembly for the District of Surrey, Cloverdale, as a member of the BC Liberals from 2001 to 2013. So let's please welcome Kevin Vulcan and Jackie Taggart. Jackie Taggart here, MLA for Fraser Nicola. And I'm Kevin Falcon, the newly elected leader of the BC Liberal Party. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Hell or High Water Telethon and for supporting our communities as they recover from one of the most challenging years our province has ever seen. As the MLA for Fraser Nicola, I can tell you that you will never find kinder, more hardworking, or more community-minded people anywhere else in the world. So true. You know, British Columbia has faced crisis after crisis over the past year. When Lytton was lost to fire and surrounding towns and First Nation communities battled one of the most devastating fire seasons on record, when Merritt, Princeton and Abbotsford, you know, were devastated by the floods that swept through the region, we saw the true strength, spirit and character of British Columbians who did whatever they could and gave whatever they could offer to help people keep them safe and supported through some of their darkest hours. Many of those most affected are now in the difficult process of rebuilding their homes, their lives, their businesses, and their livelihoods. But they could use your help. So please take a moment today and give what you can and help support fellow British Columbians in need. Every little bit really helps. I'd like to thank the sponsors of this event, the musicians, the special guests, but in particular, I'd like to thank everyone for giving hope to those who are in most need. Together, come hell or high water, we will rebuild these roads, homes, and communities. And I want to kick it off by making a $100 donation and encouraging others to follow with me. 
And I will follow you, Kevin. That's great. <laughs> so thank you all and enjoy the event. Next on our virtual stage is Taylor James. Taylor is a guitar slinging singer and songwriter and host of the Taylor James Show. She has been recording and performing roots-based music across the globe, and in doing so, she's released six collections of recordings along the way. Pretty impressive. As the host of the Taylor James Show, she pairs extraordinary wines with extraordinary musicians. Sounds like a good show to us. That makes for an interesting show by far. Let's put our hands together and welcome Taylor to our Hell or High Water virtual stage. Hey everybody, this is Taylor James coming to you from Whistler. Uh, I want to give a great big shout out and thank you to all the people who've donated to this very, very important cause. Uh, when I saw the footage on the news of the fires and the floods, it was absolutely uh, shocking. I think everybody in Canada was kind of paralyzed with sadness uh, and quite frankly, what can you do to help kind of thing. And I know that's what, certainly what I was feeling. Um, and the thing is, you know, unless you're directly uh, affected by it, meaning someone who was actually living through it, people like myself, um, once a few months goes by, you kind of you kind of forget and you, and you get on with your life. And that's the saddest part because the people who are affected are still grieving uh, the losses, the massive losses of, you know, their homes, uh, loved ones, their pets, uh, the farmers who lost their livestock, their crops, you know, their livelihood. So this is why this is such an important cause. I'm so honored to have been asked to join in this telethon. Unfortunately, I couldn't be there to record a song live, so I'm going to gift you with this uh, live performance from the Taylor James Show with my awesome band. And I hope you enjoy it. And if you haven't donated, please donate. Thank you. If I had a magic wand, I'd wave it everywhere. I'd wave it over here, I'd wave it over there. I'd stop the yelling and the shelling, no more flipping out. Every heart that wanted to could fall in love without a doubt. If I had a magic wand, I'd wave it night and day. Even if no one's there, I'd wave it anyway. Anyone can be a star, everybody take a bow. Just make sure you never take more than a little heart allowed. And I wish I could. a magic wand I'd wave it all day long I'd teach the world to sing this little magic song I'd wave it in the face of anyone who ever lost their way start a game with just one rule that everybody plays and I wish I could
We scored big time. We have another challenge from Penarosa Farms. Penarosa Farm, if you don't know, is an egg producer in Sorrento, British Columbia, Canada. Guess how much? $3,000 they have donated, and they're challenging all you food producers in British Columbia, Canada to match or beat their donation. So I guess, in other words, considering that they are egg farmers, it is better to give than to have egg on your face. Yeah, hold back that laughter. I can hear you from here. So now what we're going to do, it's up to you, the food producers of BC, to meet or beat this challenge by Penarosa Farms. Get it started and phone, text, or go to your website. Shout out from the top of the mountains. Let them know you are meeting or beating this challenge when you donate. For more than 40 years, this band, Loverboy, has been working for the weekend, delighting audiences around the world since forming in 1979. Their self-titled debut album, Loverboy, sold 700,000 records in Canada, 2 million albums in the States, and 4 million worldwide. Loverboy went on to win six Juno Awards in 1982, and they were one of the top five, get this, grossing tour acts in the world. Their success made them the first Canadian group ever to earn Columbia Records' exclusive Crystal Globe Award. And in March 2009, the group was inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Loverboy. Let's put your virtual hands together for this special performance by Loverboy on our Hell or High Water virtual stage. Hi there, I'm Mike Reno from Loverboy. Myself and the boys in the band take great pride in participating in the cause to raise funds for thousands of families displaced, homeless, and affected by the BC wildfires and floods. We ask that you give, if you can, what you can, to the Helen High Water fundraiser. Myself and the boys would like to say, stay safe, and we hope you enjoy donating to our song. Working for the weekend. Rock on, you guys. Come on, hit it, Maddie!
I'd like to thank you all for sharing the last two hours with me. I cannot express enough how I appreciate your attention and how I am honored to play a part in such a monumental effort in helping our friends and our neighbors in Merritt, Lytton, Abbotsford, Princeton, Monte Creek, and of course our friends in the First Nation communities who were all devastated by the 2021 fires and floods in British Columbia, Canada. For the next two hours, we are blessed. Our friend Roger Wright will be assuming the hosting duties of the Hell or High Water fundraiser. Give you a little bit of a spiel about Roger. He is the Q101 program director and morning show host based in Merritt, BC. Yes, that is the same community that's been affected by the fires and floods. Roger has served in every capacity in radio, from news anchor, to program and music director, general manager, and general sales manager. As well as, in case you didn't know, he used to be the play-by-play -play announcer for the Moncton Wildcats of the QMJHL. So I'd really, really like you to please give Roger a big welcome as he takes over the hosting duties of the Hell or High Water fundraiser. But first, before you close out my time, I have some friends I'd like to introduce you to, the Abrams. The Abrams are fourth generation in a line of songwriters, performers, and recording artists, and have earned a reputation as seasoned touring veterans. They perform with such an explosive energy honed over 20 years of experience. Some of the venues, Nashville's Grand Old Opera, and they have embarked on tours across multiple continents from playing community halls in Texas to a music festival in Israel. With their acceptance of the Daniel Pearl Memorial Violin Award in 2006, John and James Abrams were recognized as ambassadors for peace in the Middle East through their music. Now that's pretty impressive. All of this took place before they reach legal driving age and shows their immense talent and lifelong passion to music. Their touring career has also influenced their songwriting. They continue to write and record original country music and perform it with astonishing vigor and showmanship. The Abrams have been hard at work recording new music for all of us to enjoy, and that's coming out later this year. So please put your hands together and welcome the Abrams on our Hell or High Water virtual stage. Hey everybody, it's the Abrams, and uh, thank you so much for inviting us to be a part of Hell or High Water. What a great initiative this Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Um, you know, James and I were following the stories quite closely of both the wildfires and the floods uh, out west uh, this year, and, and um, we were really struck particularly by them uh, because it's close to home for us. Um, mm -hmm. My brother-in-law, Pierce, and his partner, Sarah, they, uh, they live out in Squamish, BC, and uh, for us, Pierce actually used to live with James and I when we lived all together in Kingston. And so we were both um, worried about them and, and uh, you know, certainly it has affected them and, and has greatly affected a number of their friends and uh, different family members out there. Um, and so, you know, I got thinking the other day and James and I were talking about this a little bit, but I got thinking about how that story might resonate differently with me or, or James if we didn't have 
somebody on the ground there that we were connected to so closely. Um, what, how would that story stick? Would it have the same kind of impact? I mean, I certainly hope so. Um, we, we, James and I both, we, we prioritize and, and really a big part of our, our um, you know, mantra in life is, is you know, helping our fellow man and, and loving our neighbor. Um, but certainly we've, we've been in, inundated for the last couple of years with tragic, difficult stories. And it's easy to get numb, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. easy to get desensitized to the tragedy that a lot of people have faced these past couple of years. Um, but we want to play you just, we're going to play a part of a song that James and I wrote a number of years ago. It was on a couple records ago uh, for us. And, and certainly we wrote it with something else in mind, but we thought it was kind of fitting because there's a line in it that says, uh, time goes by, the world moves on, but you and I keep holding strong. And I, I think tonight is a great reminder that it's easy to move on from stories like these if they haven't affected you directly. It's easy just to think the story is over, the headlines are gone, it's not being played on the news anymore. But for the folks on the ground there, I mean, this is still, and people who have been affected by these directly, this is still an ongoing story for them. And so we're asking you today, what small sacrifice it will take you to be a part of hopefully something of a positive ending to that story, even if it's not what their lives would have been, if there's some positive outcome from this story, be a part of that because they've sacrificed everything. Everything has been sacrificed by these disasters. Um, so we'll, we want to play you this song and just think about that. And so please go to hellerhighwater.ca and donate tonight. Be a part of the story. Don't just sit there and feel sympathy. Jump in and be a part of it. And uh, so this one's called Still in Love. And let's share a little bit of that love with our fellow Canadian neighbors tonight uh, who have gone through such difficulty. Let's 